The shallow, gin-clear waters of the Bahamas are a tropical paradise, a favorite spot for sport fishermen and scuba divers alike. These waters are also one of the few areas in the world where humans can regularly spend time with dolphins underwater. This is where we get the information about what the life of a wild dolphin is really about. The Wild Dolphin Project's research director and founder, Dr. Denise Herzen, has dedicated her career to immersing herself in the dolphin's world. In the wild, we deal with all sorts of challenges. Number one is weather. If we can't get to where they live, we can't see them. Number two is finding them, because they might move 20, 30 miles in a day, and it's a big ocean. And then spending regular time with individuals, if you really want to get a sense of their society, that's also challenging. We're definitely at the mercy of the dolphins. They've got interesting lives without us. They don't really need to be around us or interact with us. So when they allow us in the water to spend a little time with them, it's always a great privilege. Through decades of patient observation and meticulous photo identification, Denise has documented the lives and behaviors of multiple generations of Atlantic spotted dolphins. The group is small. We're dealing with 100 animals, so you can get repeatability in different observations. I wanted to understand their society, how they communicate with each other individually and as a group. We tend to think of higher intelligence involving things like thinking about the future, planning, problem solving, abstract concepts. Probably the one last thing on the list is language. Dolphins have shown that they can comprehend in an artificial language, things like word order and understanding. It doesn't mean they have it in their own system. That still has to be shown if it exists. This is a story about scientific exploration but it's also a story about friendship. Dolphins are like my kids, except I don't have to send them to college. <laughs> it's cheaper that way. <laughs> what can mankind learn from wild dolphins? Can we bridge the gap of understanding between us? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct and Ocean Divers. The Do Unto Others Trust. The Charles N. and Eleanor Knight Lee Foundation. And by the following. A typical summer day on the research vessel Stenella begins early in the morning with researchers taking turns searching for dolphins throughout the day. It's an expensive operation to spend four months at sea with 12 people trying to look for animals. Finding the dolphins can be a challenge, but when they appear, the excitement is tangible. The researchers take photographs of the animals for identification purposes, and when the conditions are right, they enter the water to observe and film the dolphin's sounds and behavior. Denise started her research on the Little Bahama Bank in 1985, after having seen footage of the Atlantic spotted dolphins that live there. And I thought, wow, I could plant myself here for 20 years and try to observe these animals underwater. I had seen the primate work, and it seemed to take about 20 years to get a sense of development issues, to watch multiple generations, and I really wanted to get a sense of the society and the culture. 
for the first five years, we anchored the boat pretty much in an area where the dolphins went through, and we let them come investigate us. And we'd slip in the water, take identification shots with our cameras, try to get a sense of their dolphin etiquette. Then once they got comfortable with us, we started moving the boat around and following them into areas where they were feeding or fighting. So we started seeing a lot more behavior once we moved the boat. But we really wanted to invest in their trust of us. Denise's patience and non-invasive approach paid off. By interacting with the animals in their world and on their terms, the dolphins got comfortable enough around the researchers to display their natural behaviors. We take video in the water with sound to correlate sound and behavior. We track individuals with their spot patterns and typical nicks and cuts on their body. So every season it's really important to try to get a picture of each individual. Spotted dolphins are actually nice to study, it turns out, because they get spots with age. Spotted dolphins are born without spots, and we call that coloration two-tone, because they're kind of gray on the top, white on the bottom. Then they get all sorts of dark spots on their belly, and we call them speckled. So now they're about four years old. Then at about age nine, they start getting white spots on the top, in addition to more black spots. We call that model, so that's a young adult phase. That's about the age the females get pregnant, so they can start having their first calf at about 10. The males develop later at about 15. They'll become sexually mature. Now they're really black and white spotted. The spots coalesce. We call them fused. They reach physical maturity about 25. But we've had a few individuals that have lived into their 50s, so that's probably the top end of their lifespan. It's neat to see their whole history and their relationships over the decades. In the mid-1990s, the researchers also began collecting fecal samples to better understand how different animals are related, which is essential in understanding dolphin society. We can extract DNA, and that's the only way we can really get paternity. Sound and video recordings of the in-water encounters with the dolphins give researchers an opportunity to put their noises and behaviors into context. The dolphins make basically three types of sounds. For example, dolphins make frequency modulated whistles. Sometimes they're unique to an individual and we call those signature whistles, they're like names. But they make little chirps and other little kinds of upsweeps and downsweeps that probably mean different things to them and they are not unique to individuals. Then clicks, those are basically their sonar that they might use for navigation and hunting, for example. Burst pulses are clumps of clicks. Those are very social sounds, very unstudied, they're very broadband, so there's a lot of high frequency information. Humans are unable to hear the high frequency sounds, but modern underwater microphones, known as hydrophones, can record and display them as waveforms on a computer. Each evening on the boat, the science team logs footage from the day, identifying individual animals and documenting their behavior. One of the big challenges the scientists face when analyzing sound and behavior is figuring out which animal made what noise, since humans have difficulty telling the direction of where sound is coming from underwater. When you're recording dolphins, you're just getting the sounds from a group of dolphins behaving. You cannot always tell who's making a sound, but to get the real data about how dolphins are sending signals to each other, you need a localization device. If it starts clipping... This is where Dr. Matthias hoffmann kunt from the Acoustic Research Laboratory of the Tropical Marine Science Institute at the University of Singapore comes in. Together with colleagues, he developed a special high-frequency video and audio recorder called an acoustic source position overlay device. What we were trying to do is to build a device that allows us to have synchronized high-frequency audio recording uh, with video and then overlay that so that afterwards we could tell this animal was vocalizing, this dolphin was just clicking or whistling, then this one responded, which is something that for behavioral studies would be very, very important. There's a lot of different behavioral situations where you might want to ask the question, does the mother make a whistle to get the calf back over to her, or does the calf make a whistle and the mother comes over? 
I mean, there's a thousand questions you could ask with that level of data. And up to now, that wasn't really possible. And so we came up with this device and normally sits in a pressurized housing. So you can take that snorkeling. You've got three underwater microphones here. They're high frequency. They're very, very sensitive. Then we have also a camera in here. Having three hydrophones instead of just one allows a specialized software to triangulate the source of the sound in post-processing. The camera and hydrophones are connected to a computer that can capture all the data and save it on an external hard drive for easy download later. During dolphin encounters, Matthias joins Denise in the water with the device to record synchronized video and sound that can later be compared to her recordings. What the program does is for clicks, it makes red squares, and for whistles, it makes yellow stars. When the animal clicks and whistles, you, it puts dots on that particular animal. So we know now this animal was whistling, that's, that's clear there. So you could go through and score. The same way. You know, animal A made this whistle, animal B, that would be the data analysis. I mean, that's a tool I wanted 30 years ago, but nobody could build it and it wasn't possible, really. Now it's possible. From the beginning, Denise had been studying three groups of dolphins on the Little Bahama Bank each year. These are specific clusters that were related genetically. So we had a, a northern, a central, and a southern cluster. But in 2013, something strange happened. We went out to our field site in May, and we noticed that 50% of our animals were just not around. Now, I'd been out there for 28 years, and the same individuals were resident in this area. So after about a month of looking, we finally went to the closest adjacent sandbank, and there they were, all together. It's like, what are you guys doing down here? That's like 100 miles away. The animals had crossed over 30 miles of potentially dangerous deep water to resettle on the Great Bahama Bank near the island of Bimini. So we had most of the central groups and a few individuals from the north and south moved. And we had kind of anecdotally noticed that the, the fish and the squid were kind of not around a lot anymore. So after thinking about it, we finally got some oceanographic data. And sure enough, uh, after looking at temperature, wind, and chlorophyll, which is a proxy for plankton production, in these different areas, we saw a pretty statistically significant drop in chlorophyll production on Little Bahama Bank, where the dolphins were, which amounts to probably a big change in nutrition in the whole cycle of, of fish. Nowhere else did it drop, just right there. So our best guess is they moved because the fish had crashed. Now, whether it'll change back or not, I don't know. In 2016, we saw four animals came back and we were all excited. It was like, oh, maybe they'll come back if the food comes back. That hasn't panned out yet, but we're monitoring it and we'll monitor the oceanographic data too and be interesting predictor of uh, if the system comes back. This is our southern group. You guys been studying your IDs? Anybody recommend it? <laughs> Denise has been interested in exploring the non-human mind since childhood. When I was about 12 years old, I used to page through the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I would always stop at the dolphin and whale page and wonder what was going on in their minds. As time progressed, she was curious about taking her communication research from passive observation to a more interactive approach. So in the late 90s, I got pretty interested in attempting some two-way work with the dolphins, primarily because the dolphins were showing us signs that they kind of wanted to go further. They would mimic our behavior. They'd try to mimic our sounds in the water. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to give them a tool to see where it could go? But, I, you know, I was pretty cautious. It's a pretty wacky thing to a lot of people, I think. I queried a lot of colleagues to see could we do it. And all except one of them said, well, you've got a situation where they're curious about you in the wild. You know, you could potentially develop something. So I actually recruited Adam Pack, who came out from one of the premier cognitive 
labs for dolphins because he had really great ideas and his lab had done a lot of neat experiments. In 1997, uh, I was the associate director of the Kiwalo Basin Marine Mammal Laboratory in Honolulu. And there we were studying dolphin intelligence, dolphin cognition and all of its facets. And one of the things that we were able to show is that dolphins could appreciate the core attributes of any language that humans have. And what are those core attributes? They're called semantics and syntax. Semantics are the symbols or the words which make up the language, the vocabulary. And syntax are the rules which govern how those symbols or words can be put together in different orders to create greater meaning. So for example, we understand in English that the boy bit the cat is different than the cat bit the boy. Or a Venetian blind is different than a blind Venetian. We could ask one of the dolphins to bring the frisbee on her right to the basket on her left and place it in the basket. Or we could take those same words, mix them up in a different order, and now ask the dolphin to take the basket on her left and put it on top of the frisbee on her right. The dolphin understood those the very first time we gave them, which showed the power of their understanding of language, something unique in the animal kingdom. This was the first time this had ever been done with dolphins, and it really became world famous. When I first met Denise and I came out to the Wild Dolphin Project in the Bahamas, it was easy to see that there were many things that we could name, that we could talk about with the dolphins, and that we could finally move into production and do it in a unique way. Before the late 1990s, a few attempts were made by other researchers to conduct two-way communication work with dolphins in captivity. But the technology that existed at the time limited how far the communication system could be taken. Early on, Denise and her team used a rudimentary underwater keyboard to interact with the dolphins. After about four years, we thought, well, we should probably wait till there's better technology because we're not going to go very far with this. So in 2010, I met a group of computer scientists up at Georgia Tech, Thad Starner's group, and turns out he builds wearable computers. And so it was like, well, I need a wearable underwater computer. So he grabbed the job and put some of his students on it. This is our chat box. Chat stands for cetacean, hearing, and augmented telemetry. And basically what it is is a system of computers and amplifiers inside this aluminum casing. The computer is programmed with a number of artificially created whistles for different toys the dolphins might like to play with. Dolphins have a lot of natural toys, sargassum, seagrass, sea cucumbers, so we've been trying to label as many of those natural toys as we can. We use a scarf primarily because they like to drag things and they're very good at it. That's what they do with sargassum. And it's something they have to ask us for. They can't go down to the local dolphin boutique and buy a scarf. So it kind of becomes, oh, I need the human to get a scarf, therefore maybe I'll be motivated to communicate that word. So the way it works is we're in the water. I can push a sound, for example. Scarf. This is the whistle for scarf. This headset just said scarf in English, so I know that's the sound I played. Now, if the dolphins decide to mimic this whistle, they'll mimic it. The computer will recognize it in pretty close to real time, and I'll hear the word scarf in my headset. Dolphins, when they greet each other, use their signature whistles, so we thought it'd be pretty cool to give ourselves a name. So that's my name, Denise. Now we also have some of their signature whistles in the computer. That's Brat, he's a little brat, and he's one of the players in the system. So we can greet him in his own name. So we thought that would be a start to uh, uh, trying to communicate with the dolphins. Well, the idea is to empower the dolphins to communicate back. I wanted a tool where they could access us and ask us to do things or request things from us. You have a couple researchers in the water. We're both wearing these underwater computers and you're actually modeling the communication system for the dolphins. It really requires not only good technology, but regular extended time with the same individual dolphins so that they get exposed to the system 
and start understanding the functionality of it. I mean, it's one thing to mimic a whistle, it's another thing to understand what the whistle can get you. The team discovered that juvenile dolphins showed the most interest in the interaction. This is an age where they're kind of away from mom, they're not full adult responsible dolphins yet, so they have a lot of playtime. And so we have about a four year window with individuals when they're in that age. Three to her, please. Yeah. Research assistants from Georgia Tech join the scientists at sea to fine tune and troubleshoot the chat boxes that are built by the students at the university. Making uh, new interface devices that are user friendly for marine biologists is kind of challenging from the beginning. So all of our hardware is custom designed. They use uh, 3D printers much of the time. We also have uh, machine shops in Georgia Tech, so they, they're able to mill the aluminum housings and then laser cut the other plastic parts. On a software side, dolphins present a very interesting challenge because their range of vocalizations is so large in terms of frequency. So you have to sample at a very high rate in terms of audio on the computer. So it requires a very fast processing and efficient software on battery power with something that has no internet or external connectivity to the outside world. So all of your processing is on board, whereas you know typical voice recognition things like Google Now or Siri are doing some processing on the phone or the platform and then sending it off to the internet to be analyzed on a much more powerful computer. We have to do everything on the system. All right. To my knowledge, there's no other project in the world attempting this. Over the course of three field seasons, the researchers recorded some solid data on the ways the dolphins were trying to mimic the whistles played for them by the scientists. One of the first things they started doing was just uh, producing their signature whistle after we would make a whistle. Then they started doing things like we would make a computer whistle and they would just take the end of that last computer whistle and tag on another whistle. Sometimes they would jump up in frequency and mimic the whistle. Sometimes they would just do it over a longer period of time. So it was kind of like they were experimenting to see, you know, how they could mimic. They're showing us their preferred uh, method of producing those sounds. So that's interesting in and of itself. And also it's one of the precursors that are really required of a language like communication system is the ability to imitate in various forms. The computer didn't immediately recognize the mimicked whistles the dolphins were producing during the in-water interaction. So the team is working on an updated chat system that can recognize those mimics in real time. So it will give the researcher in the water real-time information about dolphins that have requested a toy and we can respond uh, more correctly and quickly. That's the idea. In addition to the chat project, Denise is also collaborating with Georgia Tech on software that can help her decode her 30-plus year catalog of dolphin sounds. So what the programs basically do is we throw in a bunch of sound files and the computer uses some pretty cutting edge algorithms and uh, pattern recognition tools and basically clusters the sounds into categories, some of which are easy for humans to cluster, others are not so easy. So here's A, L, E. So that's a pattern that the computer can now label. So now when I look at that stream of sound, I can see, oh, A, L, E. And um, there's another A, L, E. Now we're getting into is there order and structure to their sounds? Which language you would think would have some kind of order and patterns? Do certain sounds always cluster together? Does that mean they mean something? So that's really the power of what this program does. The time it takes for a human to do that is ridiculous. So you can mine your data differently and get these patterns, and then you can start looking at it from a biological point of view. Does the ALE cluster always show up when a mother and calf are together, or certain mother and calf, or when they're fighting, or you know, whatever. And the other big point is that, do they recombine? So like we've always, always measured a whistle as a unit of information, but is that true for dolphins? Maybe they have an upsweep and a downsweep and another flat kind of whistle, and maybe they recombine them to mean different things. That's what human words are, basically. That's how you get the power of language, is you recombine segments of sound and you get different clusters, so we don't know if dolphins do that. No one's ever looked at it before. No one's ever had a computer tool to do that, really. 
Ooh, look at see, look at that throat mark. That's a good ID mark for that animal. Denise has spent decades of dedicated research to learn all she can about this group of Atlantic spotted dolphins. And she's determined to crack the code of dolphin communication, bridging the gap between our world and theirs. Denise has done an amazing job, and this is hard work, too, to form this collaborative unit, to work together, to answer one of the most important questions, I think, about animal behavior and communication, which is, you know, can we communicate with another species in their world and on their terms? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct and Ocean Divers. The Do Unto Others Trust. The Charles N. and Eleanor Knight Lee Foundation. And by the following.